Uh, right now, uh, it's time for a very interesting presentation about the MariaDB uh, max scale database proxy, and it's going to be given to you by one of the people behind uh, who is working for the Mac for the MariaDB Corporation. He also uh, has great interest in open source software, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And finally, he is also a member of the Helsinki Hackerspace. Helsinki Hack Lab. So I give to you and I want your applause for Marcus Makela. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I'm Marcus uh, from Finland, up north, cold, uh, for anyone who doesn't know Finland. Uh, yes, I work for MariaDB Corporation and I'm here to do a presentation on MariaDB Max Scale, but not only on a Max Scale. First, I have to uh, go deeper and tell what is a cluster. Most people probably know what is a cluster. Then I have to. Then I'll go into why it is cluster abstraction, and why it's important. So why we have to abstract away the cluster. We don't actually want a cluster of servers, database servers in particular. We just want one server that acts like a cluster. Then I'll go over a few examples of how this is done in the live world, uh, how I've dealt with it, and. Uh, what are simple methods of cluster abstraction that get you to a certain point. And I'll finish it off by telling you why that's not quite enough. And the second part is uh, more of a deep dive into MariaDB Max Scale, or Max Scale, what most of the users call it, uh, which is a database proxy, plain and simple. Uh, but it's not just a database proxy, it's a bit more. But first, to start off, uh, the first part, what is database cluster abstraction and how it can be done. So starting off is uh, we need a definition of what a cluster is. A cluster, the word means a group of things, more than one thing. So these are just my definitions. So I started off by saying at least two things, two nodes in a cluster are a cluster. Then those two things, two databases, need to be connected somehow. So two individual servers aren't a cluster. They're just two servers. And they need to be connected logically. This is either by shared storage or by logical replications. And uh, when I'm talking about database clusters, my experience is mainly with Mar uh, MariaDB clusters and MySQL server clusters. Some experience with Postgres clusters. Uh, so the terminology and everything is very closely related to these open source databases. So if you're from an Oracle background or a Microsoft SQL background, just raise your hand, ask questions if I'm talking something weird or, or if I'm talking too fast or if you're missing a point. So I'd like to ask everyone, if you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, I'll try and answer them. So to continue on that, the definition, my definition of a cluster is that all nodes must be active. If I have a server running and a server down, if it's my cold backup, that's not a cluster. Because when this server fails, the second one is not available. It's, it's not a cluster. So all servers are active. Even a hot standby can be considered a cluster, or they're a multi-master cluster. And what I mean by this is that the nodes are equal in the cluster. So there's no hierarchy between the clusters. Any questions? Makes sense? Good? Makes sense? Yeah. So, okay, so I classified, I did a rough split in the middle. I split the database clusters in two. I have two types of, types of data clusters. On one side, I have the master and slave cluster. So in this type, we have one master server, which is the master, which tells the slave servers what to do, and the slave servers follow the master server. So. This is a very good example of logical replication uh, in MariaDB and MySQL. This is by done by whenever you do a modification on the master, it is replicated to the slaves and so on. Uh, Amazon Aurora does this by sharing it on the storage layer. So writes go down to the storage, those are shared on that layer. And this is one authoritative node. So you write to one place, but you can read from all places. And this is by design conflict-free. I'll come to back to this later, what conflicts mean in this uh, regard. I'm not saying that conflicts cannot happen. That's very common to happen. But uh, uh, it's conflict-free by design 
only on design. And the second type is a uh, synchronous cluster. This is uh, starting from actually, if we look back, uh, the MySQL NDB cluster was probably one of the first implementations. I haven't dealt with this personally, but to my understanding, this is somewhat of a synchronous cluster. And uh, the most widely used is uh, currently a, 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 what is labeled as a synchronous a multi-master cluster is the Galera cluster. MariaDB ships it, uh, Galera bundles it with MySQL, Percona ships it as Percona ExtraDB cluster. So a lot of people, well, let's do a show of hands. How many knows what a Galera is? One, two, a bunch. This is enough. This isn't. So, okay, I'll go quickly over it. It's, you can write anywhere and you can read anywhere, but there's one problem. You're not guaranteed that conflicts won't happen. So when you do a transaction and you're trying to commit the transaction, the problem is it might fail because someone else has tried to do so. That's what I mean by conflicts. And these types of database clusters, which are synchronized, have this problem. It's an inherent problem with this type of uh, database cluster. So this is also something of a type of a database cluster. And this is uh, why it's the differences in the clusters, the different types of clusters, is that uh, database abstraction is one thing, but database cluster abstraction is more of a process, a method, or in my case, a software. Uh, and what it is, it tries to be the perfect database. That, that's not something that exists, not yet, at least. But uh, it is the perfect database acts like you would use a single database. So it's simple to use. You always know where you go. It's there. It's a service. It's always available, easy to manage and interact with. But it also has the characteristics of a cluster, which means that it cannot fail or will not fail or is very resistant to failures and uh, it scales because one server it scales up to a point and then you run out of money I mean because hardware scales up to a point but when you scale horizontally the sky is the limit because the wider you go it's cheaper to go that way than higher so hard hardware costs when you build up but when you go wide uh, is cheaper. So the perfect database would be, would scale well, be fault tolerant, but be, would still be easy to use. Now a database cluster doesn't, it fills the cluster part, but it doesn't behave like one, one machine. You have to know which server to use, where to use them, and how to use them. So uh, then why, why is all this important? Why, why do we need an abstraction layer on top of a database cluster. I mean, why? Well, it isolates complexity. It moves all these complex things into one package, hides it, and says, here's your database. So it simplifies how you, as a developer, you as an end user, use your database. And what does allow you, that allows you to do is build simpler applications. So do more work on the things that matter to you on your application, not on the cluster, not on all how to manage the database clusters, so work on your application. What it also means that if you use an abstraction layer of some sort, it allows you to use it like you would know that it always will be there. And failures are less, I mean, less failures. Uh, it's easier to maintain. So abstraction is a good thing. Um, and then also, not usually why it's done, but it's, it's a really good reason why you should abstract the database is load balancing. And uh, on load balancing and extension to read-write splitting uh, is a specific method of splitting reads and writes to different servers, so which is a very efficient use of your cluster to so improve performance in general. And uh, this, this is the first real-life example. This is probably one of the most common, not the most common, but one of the most common methods of abstracting a database is simply putting a floating or a virtual IP, which is an alias to a local server. So here in this image, we can see that we have the 10.0.0.1 uh, IP, which just happens to be mapped to the node on the left. And uh, if that node were to go down, the IP mapping would move to the second. So this is very simple. Uh, 
it's available. Of course, in Pacemaker is one. Keep Alive the Youth. These are, how many people have heard about this? Raise your hands. Raise, more people raise your hands. Okay, enough of people have it. Go, go look at them. It's good. Uh, HA stuff, uh, mainly. Uh, the one good thing about this is that it's integrated well into the cloud. It's uh, Amazon ELB. It's a load balancer. Uh, Azure load balancer. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. And they allow you to move pretty much everything into the cloud. So, I mean, Azure, everybody knows Azure. Uh, no, Azure, Amazon, everybody knows Amazon. So, uh, But the problem is this is not really intended for databases. This is not a database-specific solution. This is a general uh, connection-based uh, IP virtualization. So this is, is a solution, but it's not the perfect solution. The second option is using connectors or drivers. Uh, MySQL ND from the PHP world is a connector type which allows you to connect to multiple servers. It has uh, a failure, failover mode where it tries one server and if it can't access that it uses a second one. Uh, the MariaDB JDBC connector has a, a, a simple way of choosing these which servers to use. So this is moving some of the IP virtualization into the driver and into the application itself. This is good for not having an external dependency, we just ship it with your application. That's that. It's simple. Uh, kind of easy to set up uh, on a smaller scale. You have maybe two databases, you can use them, put it in the connector. The problem is that it's not in all connectors, it's not a universal solution. This is a very finely defined area where you can use this, and it's not for all cases. So, and uh, it also increases the application complexity because you have to know that you are using a driver or a connector that uses multiple servers instead of just one. So, uh, and the final example is a proxy, uh, a reverse proxy by uh, some definitions, and it's specialized software. It isolates the complexity of one thing, which is the one software you use, the proxying software, uh, provides a service, so it takes all, takes all these databases, encapsulates them, forms them into a one big resource, and serves that to you. And uh, there, there's also the security uh, implications by this, that it, well, if you can only access your database from one place, it's more secure inherently by compared to having multiple points of entry. So it's less of a smaller of a footprint, so less security issues. Um, this uh, concludes my overview of what is now. So any, any questions? Any? Anything? Anything? Nothing yet? Okay, so let's skip to the why we can't simply be content with this. Uh, there are problems. There's a list of problems. Uh, this is just something that came off the top of my head. So this is not a definitive list. This is not everything. There are more. There are small details that might be application specific, might be more general, might not be covered here. But a quick overview is uh, how do you handle when a node fails? Or how do you replace it? Do you replace it? Uh, what do you happen when a node goes down when it fails? Well, usually when the connection drops, you can't do anything. You have to retry the transaction, retry the query, handle that in your application. So that's one thing to take into notice. I mean, this is something that needs to be solved. Changes in topology, if I have a master-slave setup where from one server, data is replicated to another. How is that handled? Uh, and then we move into the load balancing side of this. If I want to do load balancing, if I want to utilize my servers to their fullest potential, how do I do that? Do I load balance mainly on connections only? That'll cause problems with the cluster types. Is it a master? Is it a slave? I can't load balance all. And uh, there's also a fascinating feature of, well, mainly of the MySQL and MariaDB world, also in all databases, is the connections have a state. And this state needs to be tracked, maintained, and, well, you need to know about it. So a quick overview of it is you have various variable queries might depend on previous queries. Uh, transactions are stateful by nature. Uh, you have temporary tables, all, all this stuff. And uh, yeah, so a quick look into why 
these are and what these are and how maybe to solve them is uh, node failure. Well, what do you need to do? You need to see that a node has failed. Um, you need to re re replace that node. If you see it, you have to replace it with a standby node or uh, from a pool of capable nodes. Uh, if, you, if a query was interrupted by this failure, so if a server goes down, a power outage at a data center, let's say, you have to try the query again. The abstraction layer has to try to query again somewhere else if the circumstances are correct. And with the most complete way of hiding a node failure is even doing re replaying of transactions on a separate, separate node if the, if the node where you tried to do a transaction has failed. So node failure is one problem. Changes in topology, like mentioned before, uh, if you have this, this example is that you have master and two slaves on the picture one. In picture two, the master has dropped down or it's just switched, so the server labels have been switched. This can happen, people do this. Uh, then people add a new node, why? Because they felt like they wanted to add one. People do things. Um, and then they put an old node in the maintenance. This can happen, this happens. And the abstraction layer needs to know this. So if, if the topology of the cluster changes, this, this goes both for uh, multi-master clusters where you can write to any node, so new nodes to be taken into it need to be taken into account. And mainly this is a big problem for master-slave topologies. Uh, any questions? Make sense here? Still? Good. <laughs> Transactions as mentioned, they are stateful. This is mainly, I mean, if you do it only on a one server, this is not a problem. You do it on a one server, the only thing you have to worry about if it fails. But if you want a load balance, you need to know, is my transaction open? Because if I start a transaction on one node, and then continue reading from a second node, assuming that I still get the same results, even though I only have an open transaction on the second node. I mean, this, this is not correct. This is wrong to do so. So the abstraction layer needs to know if a transaction is open, what is inside the transaction, how to handle these transactions. Um, replaying of transactions is also, it needs to know, you can't simply replay a whole transaction. There are limitations to that. Um, and well, this, this goes deeper into load balancing, uh, why you need to load balance, and this, uh, this is mainly related, perhaps later to max scale, is that query classification, you need to classify types of queries to know where you can send them. So if I have a read, okay, I know it doesn't modify the data, but I can send it wherever I want it. Ideally, I'd send it to a server that's up to date, This is not logging behind, that is able, not heavily loaded. So, uh, so send it to that one. If I have a write, I need to know where to send it. Can I send it to a slave server that is replicating from master? No, <laughs> that'll break things. People, do, people have done that. That's the wrong thing to do. So writes go to the masters. Uh, in, a, in a synchronous cluster, you could send writes to anything, but I'll come back to this later and tell you why you should not do that. Uh, well, Glera mainly. Uh, then queries might depend. Uh, last, select last insert ID for those not from the MySQL world or the MariaDB world, the more specifically. This returns the last generated ID so if I'd have the previous insert would generate an automatically generated uh, primary key, this would return it. So I need to know to send that to the server where I sent the right. And there are something like changing character sets for the client connection. Is that if I want to go from a Chinese character set to a Latin character set, I need to know that. I need to track that. And actually, I need to send that to all servers used by my applications. So this is also something that needs to be handled by the abstraction layer. And then there's, this is not really something that should be, but exists, this is critical reads. Critical reads are when you use your database like you would a single database. This is only something that happens with database clusters. So when you do an insert and you immediately select the, the value you just inserted, in a single database, even if it's outside of a transaction, you will always see the values you insert. But when you think about the cluster, if you insert to the master and immediately start reading from the slave, there's a chance, even with synchronous clusters, that when you read it, the data is not yet. So you, so you might do an insert and not get your inserted value. So that's a real problem. <laughs> and yes, this should not be done. This is 
kind of wrong to do it. And uh, the correct way would be to do it inside a transaction because the query depends on the result. And well, legacy applications do this because they weren't designed to be used with a cluster. And frameworks, they do this. And they're impossible to modify. <laughs> I, I, not, impossible would, should not be used, but I use the word impossible because it's, it's not something I control. So that was the first part of our clusters, cluster, database cluster abstraction, and why it's important. So just a quick summary is that we have database clusters, good for performance, good for high availability, but they're kind of hard to handle. And then abstraction of these is good because it hides the complexity. I mean, instead of having multiple databases, you just have one. You treat it like a one database. Uh, it makes the developer's life easier. Who, who likes easy life? Everybody likes easy developer life. Okay, yeah, that's good. So it makes your work easier. So that's what you, so if you if you move the problem from your problem to someone else's problem, that might not sound nice, but it makes your life easier by moving, bunching the problems into one thing and putting them in one place. This, I mean, this is from the for the DBAs. I mean, uh, taking a note down in the maintenance, uh, doing that so that you just toggle off a switch so that it doesn't get used, and you can do whatever you want on it. So that's also an easy maintenance. So and that's my beautifully drawn picture. It's not easy. That's, that's the, what the database layer abstraction should do. So now part into part two. Uh, what is max scale? And what does it do? And why is it more than just a database proxy? So I just a very quick overview. This is, I mean, I will not tell you the complete story of max scale. I will focus on max scale, how it hides the complexity of the cluster, how it does it, and a couple of small things. But a quick overview is that it's a modular database proxy. It's not a monolithic piece of software, but it's a core software, a fast networking core that you plug modules into to build your own service. Uh, I mean, of course, these modules come with MaxGal, so that's one thing. And this is kind of the ideology is that use only what's needed. Uh, if you need a very simple thing, group a bunch of modules together, that's that. If you need something more complex, a lot of things, you group that and use that. But due to the fact that it's modular, it's also easily extendable. You can write your own modules. You can, uh, well, it's, I'll say now it's in C and C++, so <laughs> although I did write a module for it that talks Lua to it, but uh, that's for the afterworld. Uh, so it's easily extendable. You can try it out. It's quite simple uh, on, um, to add new modules to it. Um, it's also content aware. And what I mean by this, that it truly understands the SQL clauses going through it. I'll go back to this maybe a bit more detail later on because I have a slide on that. Uh, but it does understand what is going on and how it does it. It's also cluster aware. It just doesn't treat the servers as some servers that are up or down. It knows the type of the server and what the server does. So it knows how to handle the cluster, it knows the state of the clusters. Is it a master cluster, a master server, or a slave server, and these things. It does this by actively monitoring, so it's not passive. It asks the question, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And it gathers and builds topologies based on these. And it, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all type of solution. So we have uh, our master-slave clusters, Galera clusters, even for uh, Amazon uh, RDS, we have monitoring that can be plugged in. But a uh, quick overview of the components is that uh, we have something called a service in a max scale. And this is something that provides a database as a service. Not quite as a, what you usually would call a database as a service, but it, as a service that provides a virtual database, which is formed by taking a collection of modules and bunching them in into one service. Quite self-explanatory, okay? Makes sense? Good. And then there's the monitors, which monitor the cluster. They look at the cluster, see what is happening, and they'll do the max scale itself. So pretty simple, okay? And then there's the router. That's the main meaty part, the muscle in max scale. What actually figures out when a client sends a query, where to send it. It looks at it and thinks about it and sends it to the node with uh, at least a lot of work going on. 
And then there's the magic sauce, so to say, in uh, MaxScale, which is the query classifier. This is the thing that actually pars it parses the SQL in a lightweight way and provides information to the module. So this is this is one of the reasons why MaxScale is not just some procs. It really looks at the SQL and tries to figure out what it does. So this this is the main important part. And to continue on that, it actually parses. It's based on, uh, I would say, a heavily modified version of SQLite, which is a very well known. Everybody's phone probably has SQLite in it. So we took it because it's good. We extended the syntax, made it lightweight through the actual database part, took the parsing part of that, and we used that as the lightweight classification framework. On top of that, we added an abstraction layer that tells you, is it read or write? Uh, should it go to the master server or should it go to a slave server? Uh, get the table names, uh, column names, are functions used? Uh, is it missing a where clause? All these tidbits of information that are in the query, the characteristics, this is done by the cl query classifier. So this is the SQL parser that eats the query and gives information out of it. Uh, questions? No? No? Uh, then the main thing is the read-write split. Uh, this is the bra. This is the thing that makes it chooch, so to say. It does the read-write splitting. This is the main module. There's also a more different type of routing module, but I'll focus on this because this is by far the most commonly used module. So what it does, on a abstract level, it's quite simple. Send writes to masters, reads to slaves. Uh, what does that allows you to do is gives you significant throughput improvements. If you have a cluster of uh, five servers, one master and four slaves, that gives you five, almost five times the read scalability of a single server. So they think this thing just really hides uh, and makes it easier to efficiently use your clusters. And what also this writing to master, only one master, and reading from many slaves does, it prevents conflicts. And in uh, three slides or so, we'll focus more on why conflicts are not a good thing. And uh, it also tracks session state. So if you have an open transaction, it knows it. And if you have an open read-only transaction, which cannot modify, it can be load balanced. But if you have a transaction that modifies something, you can load balance that. Uh, it also does a couple of nice tricks uh, with uh, hiding node failures. Uh, I'll have a slide on later on about that. And uh, then it also does something which is it connects to multiple servers. And by it's not actually very simple to connect to multiple servers or hide the fact that the client connects to something and then connect to many servers because you kind of have to do all the authentication thing in the middle. But this is integral to how this module works. So it connects to, fr creates, forks pretty much a connection, one connection into multiple connections. Um, necessary for failure, for example. Uh, and then the monitors, which were briefly uh, looked upon, is that they just track the status of the cluster. Is replication okay? Is this node in sync if it's a synchronous cluster? Uh, what is its state? Is it in read-only mode? I mean, all these small bits of information, and it classifies the servers. It gives them labels that this is a master and this is a slave. And um, all these, is, is it even running? All this sort of information. And uh, yeah, it's active. So it actively pulls the server at configurable intervals is that are you okay? And it doesn't like active check. It doesn't only do it on failure. So it actively detects failures. So no more deep, deeper dive into the actual monitoring part. It's uh, mainly it classifies servers. So it classifies the cluster. It tells you the individual nodes and how they behave and what they do. And it does that by having intimate knowledge of the type of the cluster it is going to use. So you pick your cluster. If you know you have a, let's say, a Galera cluster, you pick your cluster, you pick your monitor, and it knows exactly what the cluster should be doing. And um, it'll know if the server's up or down. That's pretty simple. <laughs> See if it can connect. It knows if it can accept reach or write. 
I mean, is it ready? Is it even operational? Is it in sync or not? I mean, synchronous notes can lag. Uh, but this information is used by the other modules, mainly the brooders in MaxScale, that this uh, enable to do load balancing and read write splitting. It needs to know what type of these servers are. Are these masters or slaves? So this is used by the brooders. And it's also the thing that actively generates events. Our uh, server went down. Uh, the slave lost the connection to the master, or the slave lost the slave, or the, the slave was the configuration for it was reset or something. And uh, the master slave monitor is pretty, it's pretty, it just looks at the cluster and says, this is the master, these are the slaves. It builds a topology out of them. And uh, after that, it, it figures out which is root master. So in MySQL and MariaDB replication, you can build all sorts of trees, even cyclical trees, which is not something rec that is recommended. And it'll find the right one and say, right here. So it hides all the information about which is replicating from where and all this complex networks into something just here, simple. And, uh, and everything else, it uses for reads. Uh, also, replication lag, an optional feature. Uh, the slaves tell if they are lagging, but MaxCal does actually active lag detection by writing to the master and seeing when the, the event gets down to the slave and then calculates the time difference. For Galera clusters, <laughs> I've mentioned that conf conflicts can happen. Uh, it's not a multi-master system. You should not write to multiple places at once, mainly because you, don't, you get no benefit from doing that. It doesn't really scale right uh, due to the certification things. But mainly, uh, the Galera monitor just picks a node. It has an algorithm. It, it, there's a variable that tells the index of the node. So it picks the index with the lowest value and uses that for writes. And this is something that is globally known by all possible MaxScale instances. So, so they all converge on one node, completely eliminating the chance for uh, conflicts. But this still, you get the benefit of super easy HA for the nodes. And as before, it assigns labels, master, and slave nodes. This is more of a general labels inside max scale. So this is not, often people ask, how, why, why would a multi-master node have a master and slave status? They're all masters. But this is something that max scale uses internally. So you know where the writes are going, and you know where the reads are going. Then more on the read-write split side is, uh, this is where all the nice things, or most of the nice things that really abstract the database happen. So, uh, read write splitting. This is, this is the, it's in the name of the module. This is, a, this is uh, uh, probably one of the core reasons why people use MaxScale is that it, it removes the need to know the type of the query you are doing from the client application, moves it to a specialized software that really knows what it's doing, and allows that to handle it. It, it scales out better. Uh, prevents all sorts of conflicts and uh, makes life easier. I mean, makes a lot of lives people hopefully easier. So, query classification is the first step. Is it a read? Is it write? Does it modify some session state? And uh, it uses the query classifier for that. And then it picks a server. Uh, if it's a write, we have to send it to the master, so pick a suitable server. If it's a read, it uses an algorithm, which is on the next slide, I believe. Uh, uh, depict the most, the best uh, slave server for that. So it dynamically load balances. And if it's a session state modification, um, what it does is it sends the actual query to all servers. So if you change the default database or change some session, like, well, the character set was an example. If you do that, uh, you need to do that on all possible servers so that the state is modified on all servers. This is also something that needs to be tracked. So we need, the history of these commands needs to be stored. And uh, more on that possibly later. Uh, and then when it knows the type and the type of the target server that needs to be, it actually picks the concrete server to use. This is mainly just using the algorithm to pick the best qualifying node, and after that, it's just write the query and read the result, in the best case. Uh, uh, then more into load balancing. So it does this by calculating a score for each server. It, each server starts at a score of 1,000. This is not relevant for <laughs> end users, but this is something just I happen to know. And it uses this 
as a reference and it modifies this value based on the number of operations that are ongoing. So if, if it knows that, okay, I have a thousand selects on server A, but I have zero selects on server B, and it says, okay, I mean, this looks, the server B looks like a really good candidate for this read, so it picks that one. And because it's, it's pretty much a very simple algorithm, it's, it just simply picks the server with the lowest amount of uh, active operations going on, selects, insert, writes, uh, that match the server type. This is, this, is, this is very simple. I mean, the algorithm is, is the minimum value of operations. It's as simple as that. But what this allows you to do is this dynamic load balancing is that if your server's hard drive fills up, it, if, if it uh, runs out of memory and goes into a uh, swap, what happens? It, it's almost as bad as crashing. It it's becomes super slow. So Maxcal would adapt this to by noticing it. Okay, this is starting to pile up. Connections are starting to pile up or requests are starting to pile up. It'll automatically, based on this algorithm alone, start load balancing. Although, as again said, this is something that might not be suitable for all. You might want to do it on a connection basis. You might not want, not want to open a connection to all servers. Uh, so you could pick simply on the amount of connections and connect to all of that. So you could have one master connection, connect to the ma one server for writes, and connect one server for reads, instead of connecting to all servers for reads. There's also a feature where you can do uh, load balancing based on the replication delay. I wouldn't really call it load balancing because what it really does is that it picks the server with the least lag. So you are most likely to get the most up-to-date results. And there are cases when all servers aren't equal. You might have different, let's say you buy a VM from Amazon. Uh, you have Excel, you have the small ones, they aren't equal. They are, they are nowhere near equal. So you want to manually, manually weigh them. So you can figure how, how much a server weighs or how well it performs and it adjusts to this accordingly. So you can have slower servers in a mix with faster servers and uh, it'll adapt to this load so it doesn't pile all the connections on the small load servers. Uh, and then the main interesting part is it how, how, how node failures are hidden. So uh, this, is, this is one of the smaller size, but uh, uh, read retrying is that when you do a select that is not inside a transaction, so in the MarioDB world, auto commit is enabled so that after end every statement, uh, unless a transaction has been opened, it automatically commits. Uh, so this needs to be on. So if you do a simple select, you s select for some data that is kind of old, kind of been there, and uh, you just know it, it's going to be there. So you don't need to do it in other transaction. Uh, if this fails, it's completely safe to replay it on another node because you're not doing it in a side of transaction. It means it not relate. It does not relate to any specific event. Uh, so well, you're guaranteed a reply because if the first server fla fails try the second one. And even if that fails, then try, finally, it tries again and again and again and it finds a server that actually doesn't break the connection. This is, this is not for errors, this is for broken connections. So this is again hiding, not hiding errors, it's hiding failures. And it uses the last versus master result because if your master dies, uh, after all your slave, slaves have died, you're pretty much left without a cluster. So this is one of the uh, smaller size. Um, another one is the read-only mode. This is uh, recently quite quite recent. Uh, is that if your master server happens to die, uh, what you're left with is slaves that are available. So it's kind of something that it understands that the master has died. We lost only the right capability, but we still can read. So it just adapts to that. And when you get a uh, when you get a write and it detects a write, it, it either closes the connection, or it can be configured to send an error to the client, which can then adapt. Uh, it tracks the session state that is mentioned. Uh, you need to record, and if a server fails and it picks up a replacement server, it replaces that. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. Then more on the interesting, interesting side of MaxCal is filters, and they're, they're the thing that sit between the client connection and the router, so they, so they are 
before the routing happens, there's this module we call filters, and they they do all sorts of things: uh, pre-processing, analytics, target hinting, uh, and they change. They're pretty much the same as a Unix pipe. You pipe the output from one filter to the second, and finally to the router. So it's very comfortable for our all, all command line users, let's say. Uh, and it's the first community contribution was uh, something called TPM filter, monitors transaction performance, was by, I don't remember his name, but it was a contribution. Uh, and one thing uh, is the critical reads. We brought a filter for that because this is not actually something that you should do. But we noticed that, okay, it's a problem with some frameworks, and uh, we wrote it. So it, after each write, it detects, okay, a write has happened. I know if I have selects, it can be configured to pin the, the uh, session to the master. So it keeps sending the reads to the master for either a configurable amount of time or a number of queries. It's pretty, pretty nice. Uh, then there's the regular expression filter, which is pretty much set for SQL, for those from the Unix world. Uh, what it pretty much allows is to fix broken SQL. I mean, when you, when you have SQL, when you notice that, oops, it, uses, it does this something that causes horrible performance, and you know, okay, I would only need to fix this one little part of the statement, you can actually do it with this. So it's more of a post-release patching kind of thing. It also allows all sorts of things. Anything you can do with uh, regular expressions on a query. Uh, append a limit clause. I mean, given a complex enough regular expression, you can do, you can go wild with this thing. Uh, PCRE2, which is real nice, a lot better than uh, some of the standard uh, POSIX regular expressions. Uh, so that's roughly about the deep dive part. Not horribly deep, but could go deeper. I don't know if you can take the deeper one, but uh, a quick summary is that we have three really interesting types of modules. There are more authentication and protocol, but those are kind of on the MySQL, MariaDB side, like protocol level stuff, how authentication is done. And those are also configurable because it's modular. And uh, a quick overview is that monitors provide information, routers use this information, and the filters extend and really allows you to go wild with this. And just, a, I mean, this this is uh, my first impression with MaxScale was when I started working with this, is the clusters are hard, but they're necessary, or we need them. So use the right tool, work smart, not hard. And uh, I mean, and MaxScale is kind of a toolbox. You can, you can pick the right tools, use them, and that's that. And thank you. And first of all, the slides of please try this. I spent too many too many hours on these QR codes. So um, you can find the slides there, and you can find a link where you can download, try and all, all sorts of max scale there. Uh, I believe these slides might have more links, all, all QR codes. I went kind of wild with them. So uh, yeah, uh, one main question: Do you have questions? You have questions? Yeah, please go yes, ahead. Yes, we have, have a couple of minutes, so let's take one or two quick questions. We have 56 seconds. Quick questions. What max scale from becoming a single point of failure? By no. having multiple max scales. I but mean, then, then don't you have the same problems with having uh, multiple servers in a cluster that your application has to know about all the max scale servers connects to? Oh, yeah, but you can put a max scale on your local application. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you have, you have a valid point. Where, where do you put, draw the line with HA? I mean, how, how do you have multiple client applications? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a valid problem. And this is, it takes you to one level. This is not an absolute solution. I mean, this is, this is not the, the perfect database. It's, it's, it's getting there, but it's not the perfect database. So that's a very, very good point. And uh, right now, I don't have an answer for you. Or actually, a solution. Any more questions? Anyone else? More uh, questions, please. Yeah. Do you know about TIDB or CockroachDB? And can uh, you compare? Cockroach. 
Cockroach DB and oh, yeah, TI, yeah. TIDB. I think it's basically the, uh, both open source re-implementations of uh, the, the, the global geo-distributed database from Google. I, 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 I don't remember the name. I, I, I'm sorry that, to say that I haven't really, I've taken pretty much a quick look at the website and I haven't really done definitive uh, a look into their methodology and how it is. So I can't really say how different it is, but uh, it's out there. But, yeah. Uh, any questions? Did I sp speak something that doesn't make at all sense? If you Anything? Do have any questions, Marcus will be here to the end of the day. We hope. Yeah, I'll be here until tomorrow, 4:30 a.m. So. <laughs> so yeah, till a very specific a. time. Exactly. So yeah. you can find him, grab him, even at 4:25 a.m. Oh, 4:25 is okay. Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll be 4:30. 4:30, I'm yeah. in a taxi. So grab him. For questions, coffee, Bulgarian beer, even though he says he doesn't drink some Bulgarian beer, we'll do him just do fine. An and so give him a last round of applause for Marcus. Thank you. Thank you.